Greetings. It's good to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me into your homes uh, on this third week of Advent. Here in the church at Redwater Alliance, we we lit the candle of joy. And uh, it was just a great joy to be worshiping God today. And uh, I pray that would be uh, for you as well as you listen to this message uh, about uh, the great joy and peace that Christ has brought into the world. Uh, We began a couple of weeks ago during the Advent season, and now it seems like we're just under maybe one day short of two weeks away from Christmas. And I don't know about you, but as I look back over the different Christmases I've gone through, it seems that sometimes I really only have two gears during this season. First gear, which is slow and easy, and then I sometimes just move right straight to sixth gear, you know, foot to the mat, full speed ahead, and before I know it, the new year is upon me. And for me, the Advent season, in part, is a reminder to stay in first gear, to slow down, to take it easy. Because with all the sights and sounds and smells of the Christmas season and all the other activities that can take up plenty of our time, Advent, if we allow it, if we purpose it to, will help us focus on the real reason for Christmas. Yeah, this was mentioned, uh, the new year comes quickly, and often it's just back to the same old, same old, uh, year in and year out. You know, indeed, we are, as uh, humans, <coughs> pardon me, creatures of habit. But here's the good news. Habits, any kinds of habits, can be changed. Of course, difficult, but doable. And as I was pondering all this uh, during the Advent season, I was drawn to one of my favorite Christmas hymns, Joy to the World. And I wondered about its origins. I wondered about who wrote it. And I thought that it'd be good uh, to me, profitable to me, and I want to share that with you now um, about the origins of this wonderful hymn. With the help of uh, with the internet, I, I think I found my first gear for this Christmas season. The story of this classic uh, Christmas hymn goes back to the 1700s. And in Europe in those days, the majority of the worship uh, songs were from the Book of Psalms. And a young 15-year-old Isaac Watts felt that worship songs were, quote, unnatural to him. In other words, unnatural to sing in the modern English uh, language or modern English translations. And the story goes that on one Sunday, 15-year-old Watts complained about the worship. And he was challenged by one of the deacons of the church that he attended to, quote, give, up, give us something better. And Watts accepted the challenge, and by the end of that very same day, he penned his very first ever hymn, Joy to the World. In 1719, uh, Isaac Watts published a book called Psalms of David Imitated. And Joy to the World was Watts' imitation, if you will, of the last half of Psalm 98. Watts transforming a psalm of praise to a song rejoicing, rejoicing of the salvation of God revealed when Jesus was born. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And as for the rest of the story, the 15-year-old Isaac Watts went on to become a preacher, minister, theologian, and prophetic hymn writer. I think he wrote something like over 700 hymns. Luke's gospel reminds us, I believe, of the source of Watts' inspiration. As shepherds were tending their flock one night, an angel of the Lord appeared. And naturally, the text tells us they were terrified, as we all would be. And the angel said to the shepherds, Do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Friends, this is the answer to the same old, same old. To sixth gear, foot to the mat, full speed ahead. To all our toils and troubles and all the events of our lives over this past year. Because the good news of great joy for all people has come. Because Christ has come. And you and I can live in the joy of the Lord every day. And we can praise his name for that. So please turn into your Bible, in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. 
And uh, I'll be reading the first 20 verses of that chapter for context. And uh, it goes as follows. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census, census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Cornarius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in the manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, as we consider and ponder, as, with, as Mary did, the, uh, the season of preparation leading up to Christmas. And Lord, I pray that we would stay in first gear and slow and easy and and, and read this uh, wonderful text over and over, this Christmas story, the true Christmas story, the reason for the season. Holy Spirit, help us to do that, and that it would bring you great glory, O Lord. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, with this context in mind, uh, we will focus today specifically between verse 8 and 18. And we want to begin by asking who's who in our text, at least to get an idea of what's going on there. It's pretty straightforward. The characters include the shepherds who were living out in the field, tending their flocks at night in this particular event. There's the angel of the Lord, and we can go on and try and figure out who this angel of the Lord is, but it's not necessary. There was the angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord was also joined by what the text tells us is a great company of the heavenly host, and they were praising God. And friends, there are other details that we could spend some time on that would be profitable for us today. But more important to note is the contrast that we find in the text here. We see that the birth of Jesus was located in the time and world of Caesar Augustus. That first one tells us that. And Caesar Augustus, or Caius Octavius, was the... Um, um, grandnephew, the adopted son of and heir to Julius Caesar. And after Julius Caesar died, Octavius rose to be the undisputed ruler uh, in 31 BC by defeating his rival, Antony, at the Battle of Actium. Maybe you've seen the, the movie uh, Cleopatra, there, that battle is relived there. Octavius then became the very first Roman emperor he was given supreme military authority, and he reigned, according to the historical uh, documents, until A.D. 14. Octavius, now given the name Augustus, and this name Augustus really uh, was one that afforded him to be seen at and viewed as one with divine authority. And later on, and not too far down the road, uh, this 
um, idea of the um emperor having divine authority would morph into the, uh, the cult of the emperor worship. And uh, Augustus, uh, we look at his rule in history, and we see that he was very effective. Uh, he brought Roman peace and prosperity and glory to the Roman Empire. But of course he did this because he had possessed of absolute authority and, and, and he did it through uh, combat and arms. While Augustus ruled in the temporal world at the time of birth of Jesus, uh, we find in our text another world. This is the contrast. We find the eternal world, the eternal place. A world that has a divine purpose. God had sent his angel Gabriel to announce to Mary of the birth of Jesus. And here in our text, we have the fulfillment of that announcement. Going back to the world of Augustus, there the glory of the emperor and the rule of the Roman Empire by might, the power, the wealth, and the title. These were all marks of what was valued and sought after. Honor above all else was more valuable than even gold in many cases. Honor for self and honor for the empire. Yet here in the text, in this contrast, we have the divine purposes of God revealed for us in the text. For a king is born without the world's honor. No pomp, no circumstance. The king was born in a cave alongside animals. A king that was born without any fanfare whatsoever. Jesus was greeted by shepherds and later as a toddler, he would be visited and given honor by pagan magicians. And as all four gospels reveal, Jesus would become a rabbi, a rabbi whose disciples included all sorts of a motley crew. Nothing that would have been uh, considered uh, in that culture as worthy in the Jewish culture. We have tax collectors, we have zealots, those who wanted to overthrow the Roman Empire. We have, you know, uh, just simple Galilean fishermen. We have all sorts of others, too, that were from the fringe of the culture and society that followed Jesus and listened to his teachings. Everything about the king sent from heaven was different than all the ways people viewed kings in the Roman Empire. And when it came to his very own people, the Jewish people, Jesus would not fit their standard, as I've already alluded to, of who the Messiah would be or could possibly be. We bring it back to the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. And this is the contrast, I think, here in the 21st century we often miss. You see, friends, the baby born in a manger, in a cave, is more than our family traditions, as well as they are good traditions. They're, it's more than that. It's more than the Coca-Cola Christmas of our culture. Luke reminds us to slow down, to stay in first gear. For the baby wrapped in cloths and placed in a manger is as Gabriel announced to frighten shepherds, a savior. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Now we're going to go through a number of uh, uh, texts. We're going to bounce around between John and Paul and Back here in the text, so uh, bear with me, and if you can track with this, maybe take a note or two, that'd be very good for you. But imagine with me what might have gone through Mary's mind once the shepherds left. For verse 19 tells us, Luke uh, gives us this information, that Mary treasured up all these things that she had witnessed, and she pondered them inside her heart, in them in her heart. No doubt Mary would have remembered what Simeon said about her back in uh, uh, said to her about her baby that a sword will pierce your own soul too. And she was probably wondering, what does that mean? What is that going to look like? What sort of questions were running through her mind? Maybe it was, what is my baby going to do or, or be when he grows up? Uh, what is going to happen to him? You see, you and I are in a somewhat of an advantage. We have the Bible, which maybe answers some of those questions for us. We go to Matthew's Gospel, for example, and there Matthew records for us what the angel of the Lord said to Joseph concerning Mary, if you remember that story. We know that Joseph was thinking about divorcing Mary quietly, and the angel said to Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. You are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from, his sin, from their sins. 
Now we go, as I said, we're going to bounce around a bit to John's Gospel, which reminds us that God so loved the world that what? He sent his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Why did God send his only Son? Well, the next very verse tells us not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him, that is, Jesus. Staying with the Apostle John, we go to his first letter, where he said, We have seen and testified that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Now we go to the Apostle Paul in his letter to Timothy, his beloved co-worker, where he said, This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance, that we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially those who believe. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Mary, the baby in your arms, is the Savior of the world. Moving along, we go back to Jesus in Matthew's Gospel, and he asks his disciples, if you remember this, this event in chapter 16 of Matthew, uh, he asks his disciples, who do you say I am? And the ever upfront and uh, not afraid to speak, Peter said, uh, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this very same Peter, uh, after the ascension of Jesus and the day of Pentecost, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he spoke to the Jewish crowd that had seen and heard all this event. He said to them, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. We go back to the Apostle Paul. We know that in Acts chapter 9, we find his, uh, Acts chapter 8, we find his conversion. Or chapter 9, pardon me. And that happened on the way to Damascus, on the Damascus Road. And then Paul would stay in Damascus uh, and be with the believers. And then he would also go throughout the synagogues in the city of Damascus, uh, preaching the gospel. And we find in Acts chapter 9, the text reminding us that how many were amazed how people had cha- how Paul had changed. He was this persecutor of the church and the Christians, and now he was preaching the very gospel, thereby proving that Jesus is the Christ, is what the text tells us. Mary, the baby in your arms, is the promised Messiah. We go to John chapter 13, and there we find Jesus and his disciples around the Passover feast, and John, the only one in the gospel, includes the event and the account of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And after Jesus was done washing their feet, he asked his disciples this question. Do you understand what I have done for you? He doesn't wait for a response. Jesus said to them next, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Go back to Apostle Paul, bouncing around John, Paul. Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Philippian church, he exhorts the believers there to have the same attitude as Jesus Christ. And what was that attitude? I would recommend you read Philippians chapter 2. There we find that Jesus, who being God, did not consider himself, consider himself nothing, taking on the very nature of his creation. He humbled himself even to the point of and obedience to the point of death on the cross. This Jesus was exalted, the text tells us, to the highest place with the name given him above every name, that every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Mary, the baby in your arms is the Lord. Friends, during this season, we must not let the culture and all the events and all the things happening during this season distract us from the babe in the manger. As one writer said, quote, for Christ, for Christ, Christmas is not about tradition, but salvation. Christmas is about love, earthy, gritty, sacrificial, even bloody love. Friends, we must not allow ourselves to stay in sixth gear, for the babe in the manger is the Messiah, our Savior and Lord. Can I ask you this question? Where will you find Jesus this Christmas? Where will you find Jesus this Christmas? We see here in our text, after the angel of the Lord and the heavenly host praised God, the angels departed, and the shepherds said to each other in verse 15, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. The text informs us that they hurried off 
and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. You see, they followed the sign given to them by the angel. And one wonders if these shepherds found the baby Jesus, when they found the baby, if they remembered what the prophet Micah had said about Jesus some 700 years before. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who is a ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Maybe they thought about what the prophet Isaiah, contemporary of Micah, had said about and prophesied about Jesus, one that we are probably, some of us, very familiar with. We read, we, we hear the prophet speaking, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Can I ask you, what signs are you following this Christmas? What are your expectations this Christmas? It is the busiest time of the year for businesses. It is the biggest commercial event of the year. It can make or break a company. You know, you think about all the marketing experts and all the, the catchphrases and slogans that they've come up over the years to attract business, catchy ones. Here's some of them, deck the halls. It's a season of giving. Dream a, dream a little dream. And I, I want to pick on Coca-Cola again. Uh, they, they've had these slogans, give a little happiness. You're the ice in my Coca-Cola. And then the last one, Coke adds life to holiday fun. My friends, Isaiah, Micah, and Zechariah in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, highlights the peace that God promised for his people. The great company of heavenly hosts in response to the angels' news, to the shepherds, praise God, saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Peace, my friends. Paul, in the letter to the church at Ephesus, said, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He came and he preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who are near. Jesus, in John's Gospel, I would recommend you read 14, 15, 16, and 17. You really see the heart of our Lord. He said to his disciples as he was comforting them before he was arrested, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives, but do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Where do you find your peace at this time of year? Or are you at peace? Maybe you're self-medicating. Maybe you're following the signs of our culture. You know, like the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland, I'm late, I'm late for an important date. And without realizing, you're like the frog floating around and slowly the, the water boils and they all of a sudden cooked and spiritually exhausted. Maybe we should be more like Mary, who treasured up all the things that happened from the very first time the angel Gabriel uh, came to her. Or maybe we should be like the shepherds who left their flocks and went to find Jesus. And guess what happened when they found Jesus? Did they go back to their flocks? No. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. Then they went back to their flocks. And on their way, the, we are told, they were glorifying and praising God for all the things they heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Where will you find Jesus this Christmas? What are your expectations this Christmas? Going back to the writer I quoted at the beginning, quote, the biblical pattern teaches us that Jesus is not particularly concerned with your expectations and may ignore them altogether because he's mainly concerned with our most desperate needs. Think about it. Often, what do we do with our fears and our sins? What do we do with them? Well, we bury them, don't we? Deep inside our hearts. We lock them up in a cage. And there they are, always there before us. 
filling ourselves with all sorts of things during the Christmas season, especially at this season. Yet this is why Jesus was born, my friends, to help us confront our fears and sins, to bring his light into those dark places of our life and free us from fear and forgive us of our sins and bring hope and life into our lives, not just for today, but for eternity. Where will you find Jesus this Christmas? I believe Jesus is with the brokenhearted parents whose child died of cancer last month, or the single mother who has nothing to offer her children at the Christmas meal, but a meal of craft dinner filled with her love, or with the broken and abused woman who with all her courage and strength on shaking knees finally mustered up enough courage to ask for help. I know where I will find Jesus this Christmas in those places of my life that desperately need his forgiveness, his healing, his comfort, and his peace. Where will you find Jesus this Christmas? Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Pray with me. Father, we thank you. We thank you that in eternity past and in the purposes and the divine plan of the Trinity, and we see it beginning in human history and right at the Genesis there in 315 and carried on through all redemptive history leading up to this, this time we're going to be celebrating the birth of Christ. That you had promised the Messiah and you did send that promised Messiah to your people Israel and to all the rest of the world. And help us, Lord, to slow down. Help us, Lord, to ponder like Mary did. Help us, Lord, to be like the shepherds and go tell someone about this great news that came as a babe in a manger in a cave without any fanfare, without any pomp, without any circumstance beyond a simple birth at the right time in history by the divine purposes of you, O Lord. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Well, thank you very much. And in case you don't track with me anymore or track these, uh, these sermons, you're busy or you're going away or something, uh, on behalf of Redwater Alliance Church, on behalf of myself and my wife, Pat, uh, uh, we wish you all a very blessed Merry Christmas and a very happy new year. Shalom.